coming up, and I want everybody to get this, and if, you're, if, if you can get a camera and make sure this goes on the internet. This will be the biggest Warrior Fest ministry team we've ever had. We will have me, Amanda Stone, Chris Estrada, Wake and Dance Team, Tony Suris, Nick Walker, Jacob's Tent Dance, Jacob's Tent Dance Team, Catherine Mullins, Lydia Mara. Lydia is the redheaded girl. She's John Kilpatrick's praise and worship leader. Uh, incredible. She's another Lyndall Cooley, actually. And uh, Eddie James and his team. And it's April, Friday, April the 5th, Saturday the 6th, Sunday morning the 7th. Registration will begin in January. Now bring the other one up because this is one everybody is already talking about. Um, I think most of the Gainesville Church wants to come to this one, so you better register when the registration opens up. Do you have that other one, uh, Jonathan? There we go. The Prophetic Summit. Now, this will be the 25th. It starts on Thursday. Jonathan Kahn will be back. And you know Bill, myself, you got Mark Bilch, you got Lance. The man in the middle is the expert on transhumanism turning humans into robots, which is what three of America's billionaires are wanting to do. They're wanting to chip you in your brain where the chip will control everything you do. He is the, he is the number one expert in America. So that registration will open up sometime in January. And I'm, I'm publicly going to say this. Please do not just register your cousin, your aunt, your uncle, because we get people registering who don't come, and then, I, then people lose a seat. So if you're coming for Warrior Fest, register, let the youth pastor register. If you're a parent bringing your kids, only bring the kids you know are definitely coming. And that way we'll get a better registration because we, uh, as you know, this uh, particular... What is that noise? That's the first time I've ever heard that. Can anybody tell me what that is in the building? Have you heard that before? Is it the mics? No, it's not the train. Hang on. Jonathan, can y'all figure this out? It is a bass. Hang on. Okay, now this is this is weird. I heard guitar music. Thank you. Shoo. I heard I was at my aunt's house and heard guitar music in the attic when nobody was there, and then I heard someone talking out of the garage that was locked. So <laughs> I'm going to run out and not preach if, that's, if, if voices start. <laughs> that's really true, by the way. I'm not going to explain that. I'm not even going to talk about that, which is weird. Okay. Somebody say, I'm ready. ready. Now say it like you really are. Ready. That was a delayed reaction right there, but that'll work. I told you that this would happen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 through 6. Jonathan, I think I'm using the King James translation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. And I'm going to take just a phrase that Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, Greece. And I'm going to key up on that phrase, which is the title of this message. And, and you don't really know where I'm going with this, I know, but I kind of like it that way. <laughs> okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 through 6. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, speaking the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord, shall not come except a falling away first. There comes a falling away first. Who apostasia? The apostasy. And that is a definite phrase. And there's three possible meanings to that, but the primary meaning of apostasia is to depart or defect from the truth. And there's other meanings, of course, as well that scholars get into from the root Greek word. And the man of sin be revealed. This is the Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what restrains him that he might be revealed in his own time. The first letter ever written by the Apostle Paul is not 1 Corinthians or Romans. It's 1 Thessalonians. He had been to the Arabian desert, some suggest, one to three years. 
He said, I received in Arabia the revelation of Jesus Christ. He penned seven major mysteries that were unknown to anybody in the Old Testament in his 14 letters that he wrote. And he mentioned the coming of the Lord in five different chapters. He did not put the chapters in, they were added later. But the coming of Christ, including the one chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, that is what we call the rapture chapter, was penned by him. So he was very aware of the coming of the Lord. Now, what happened was when he sent that letter, copied it and sent it to the churches, Someone forged a letter in Paul's name and followed up with a letter that said the day of Christ had happened, the resurrection had taken place, and everybody had missed it. He has to write a second letter, that's what this is about, and he begins to tell them, do not be troubled, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, by letter or by word or by spirit from us if the day of Christ is at hand. Then he tells them, I have already told you this. Let me just say it this way. He's, he's almost expressing to them, have you so soon forgotten the first letter I wrote to you? I told you what would happen. I told you that you would be a part of it if you were alive. But you have let someone sneak in and alter the doctrine or the teaching that I have shared with you. Now I remind you that I have told you these things. There are four levels of God revealing the future, which Paul used, and the apostles of the Bible. Number one, 2 Peter chapter 1 and 19, there's what's called a sure word of prophecy. If it is in the New Testament or Old Testament in the 66 books, and it is a prophetic word that has not yet happened, you can call it a sure word of prophecy. It will come to pass eventually. Secondly, there is what's called the spirit of prophecy, who is the Holy Spirit, that John 16, 13 says, will show you things to come. Third is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 7 through 10, the gifts of the spirit that are three vocal gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of prophecy. And the fourth way, based on scripture, that God reveals the future, is what is called speaking by revelation. Not the book of Revelation, but speaking by revelation. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 6, Paul said, When I spoke to you, I spoke to you by revelation, which was the inspiration of God coming into his spirit, revealing something concealed that he was making known to them. Let me say something. Many times when Dr. Cutshaw is speaking, you don't pick up on it. I do as a preacher. He is telling you things by revelation of the Holy Ghost. He is showing you things from a verse that he has not added to nor taken away, but on that verse he has a nugget. Sister Rhonda does this. If you are filled with the Spirit of God, you will at times speak by revelation. Now, I want to make something clear here. Um, YouTube, for example, is a great way of getting messages out. Most of you know that we have almost 800, we're about... Uh, 100 people away from 800,000 subscribers on the Perry Stone YouTube channel. So if you're watching, if not subscribed, get us up to a million and they'll tell you why I wanted to get a million. There's a reason for that, subscribers. But let me share with you something that I've noticed. There are many people that are coming on there saying, urgent prophetic word. And I'm going to make a statement and I hope I don't offend anybody. I hope no one gets mad at me. But a lot of these people, it's always a picture of the White House, and it's about Trump. Can I tell you something? God has more in mind than who the president of the United States is going to be. Now, we might be concerned who it is, but, you know, we're only one of many nations. China has a billion, over a billion people. India has over a billion. We don't even have 400 million. And it's like God is in the throne, very concerned that the United States will elect the right leader. Let me tell you, we have tr put our trust in politicians to change things, and we're still in the biggest mess that we've ever been in in our life. I want to tell the body of Christ, and I want to tell those of you watching me, that there is not one single man that can straighten out the mess that we've, we've got ourselves into. The mess is only going to be straightened out when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords comes riding back on a white stallion to the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives splits in half and Satan is bound for a thousand years 
in the bottomless pit, that's when things are going to straighten up. Should you vote? Yes. Yeah. Should you vote the right people? Certainly. But I see people that call themselves prophets and yet half of what they say never comes to pack. I would like to tell you, you are a non-prophet. <laughs> now, my wife got me. This is, a, this is a, a little break here before I get to the next thing. Uh, this is a brand new thing that is driving me completely up a wall, and I feel like throwing my phone. This is a <clears throat> new uh, Libra thing that you do this with that buzzes every time your sugar changes and it keeps me awake at night. Would somebody take my phone, please away, Charlie, please take this and turn it down or do something. And it will tell me, it says a uh, uh, signal loss alarm. That means my sugar is dropping. My, it's not dropping. It's probably about 180 right now, which is normal. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> my OCD just kicked in. O D D A C D D D D A A A D P H D M S D. I mean, you know, <laughs> I have all of them. Just so you'll know that you're you're looking at a very unusual minister. Over the years, for many many years, there are five events I saw in advance, and I thought about giving you the pictures, but some of you have already seen these, and I'll go through these very quickly. In 1996, in Brooksville, Florida, I saw a vision, not a dream, a vision of the World Trade Center shrouded in black with five great tornadoes coming off of it. That was fulfilled on September the 11th, uh, 2001, with the attack on the Trade Center. And I actually went on national television with drawings and pictures and said there would be a terrorist attack on the Trade Center. And believe it or not, people start blaming me in the media that bin Laden took the idea from me. I'm sure Bin Laden watches Christian television, right? And from, from hell, you understand he's down there on cable, okay. 1998, the Lord spoke to me that it was his will for the governor of Texas to be the next president of the United States. We met him in Israel on November 29th uh, of, of uh, Charlie, what year was that? Can't hear you. 2000, 2000 uh, no, 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 we met him before he became president. Yes, no, no. Bush, Bush, 98. Charlie, wake up. Okay, it was 1998. <laughs> he had the election date right. In 1998, we were in Israel. He was at the wall. We told him to run for president. The Lord had told me that it was his will for him to be the next president of the United States, and, of course, that did occur. In the 1990s, I had a vision, not a dream, of an oil rig off the coast of Louisiana creating a terrible situation with shops closing down, malls closing down, uh, a crisis on the coastal area. And I warned Dino Rizzo, who was the pastor of Healing Plate Church in Baton Rouge at that time, what was going to happen. And Dino remembers it quite well. And, and as a matter of fact, when the rig uh, exploded, uh, I don't want to go into the details. This is what we do have pictures of and things of this nature. I went to preach at Dino's with the original paper in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the month of July, and they said it's a disaster. We may never be able to fix this. And I got up and said, if we will pray today at Healing Place Church, 2,000 people were there. God's going to give us a solution, and this is going to stop. And a man was in his bathtub. The story is told, and he said, oh, my goodness, I know how to plug it up, and he plugged it up the next week. And God stopped that terrible disaster from taking place. How many remember the oil rig off the coast of Louisiana? I saw that two years before. Most of you know that in the 2016 election, three times. We, you were there in West Virginia when I preached it in July. I preached it the night before the election at Walter Hallam's church that the, the number 45 is mem hay, and when you take the mem and the hay, the numerical value is 45, and mem hay means what? And I told you that when the presidential election ended uh, in 2016 and when the person was elected, the entire world would say, what? How did that happen? How many were here the night we watched the election? Did it happened that way. Fox News three days later said, what? How did Trump get elected? What, what, what? So we talked about that. We heard in our voice in the middle of the uh, night, I woke and heard the military men on speakers talking about, we've got him, we've captured him. Bin Laden is dead. I heard the report verify with the DNA. I heard the entire conversation one week later. Nick, were you, were you there when that happened? Or do you, do you know about that one? I think I told you and I told people that we're going to capture bin Laden in one week to the day when the Lord gave it to me, it happened. Now, I'm saying this to you to say to you that I have a, 
uh, an anointing, and I say this humbly, I don't say this in any way to point to myself because I don't want people to ever do that. But the Lord has allowed me for some reason to see things before they happen or to tap into the prophetic realm uh, many times, months or years before an event takes place. And uh, I'm not going to talk about this tonight. We just did a television program that's coming out Charlie, when will the special television program come out? When do you think it's going to... It, people are asking me. Next week. At Thanksgiving weekend, maybe, or the week after. Week after Thanksgiving. And the Lord visited me, and I saw a tsunami once again. And he told me, here is what, is what will trigger the tsunamis in America. And I knew I had to do something. I'm, I'm praying that the stations, that are secular stations, will not ban that program because uh, of some of the things I say at the end. If they do, you just go to perrystone.org. You can't ban that. Because we own the computer systems underground that run. Okay. So... My point is that there have been times uh, that the Lord has given me things nationally and internationally that, that were to take place, that did take place, and I say that very humbly. I have no reason to explain to you or no explanation to give you as to why he allows that to happen at times. I've seen actually football players that were going to win national championships. Some of you know the story about Tua Tungavaloa, what happened to me there, and how we became close to Tua and the Tungavaloa family because of something God gave me 10 games before at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium uh, when they were playing Florida State several years ago. So these things happen. Some things I've never told you. Some things are personal and private for the family that the Lord has revealed to us. But I want you to know that just because God shows you these things does not mean that you're a prophet. It does not mean you're a prophetess. It just means you're praying. And anyone is susceptible to this gift of hearing from the Lord if they will pray. Now, something I saw shifted. Um, I am presently, and this is where we're going to get into the word of the Lord that the Lord wants me to give you, and I want you just to carefully listen to what I'm going to say. Normally, I preach through this. I kind of blow through this preaching pretty fast. I'm going to slow it down where everybody can hear it and hear the what I'm going to say because I must, I must say it the way that the Lord gave it to me. But uh, I'm presently 64 years of age, and I must tell you, I feel it. Uh, some of you who are in my neighborhood hanging out, uh, know that you feel it as well. Where's my people who can feel it? Raise your hands. God Almighty, that's why I love you, because you're so much like what I feel, you know. I soon will be 65 years of age, and if there's something God taught me the hard way, is, Perry, you don't need to work harder, you need to work wiser. Don't work harder, work wiser. What does that mean? For 46 years of my ministry, during that 46 years of time, Pam and I traveled. We traveled before Jonathan was born, when Jonathan was born. When he went to school, uh, she didn't travel with me as much. I took a team of men and different people with me on the road. And then when Amanda came, she homeschooled, most of you know that, for about 20-some years. And she was able to go to our summer meetings, but not so much to the regional meetings. But Pam and I have seen revivals break out in areas Pulaski, Virginia went five weeks. Now, this is every night. La Follette, Tennessee went 11 weeks every night. I started in the winter months and ended in the late spring. Uh, we had uh, Dalton, Georgia went five weeks. We had Daisy, Tennessee. That's where I met Kathy. Raise your hand. Kathy was just a teenage girl with longer hair back then because she was sanctified and in the church of God <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. And uh, she met us at Daisy, Pam and I at Daisy, for an eight-week revival that lasted there. And But in that time of preaching, not only did we minister the Word of God on the road, but the Lord has helped me to write uh, by myself. I don't use ghost writers. I write the books, 100 books, an entire commentary on the Bible that was a million-word commentary that took seven years to do, writing all my messages. No one ghost writes my messages. I write all the messages for the Manifest Telecast, 52 programs a year. I write all of the YouTube messages, which I don't 
don't even know how many of those there are now. We write all the messages for the conference. We do all the PowerPoint. I say we, me. So I'm involved very, very heavily with this. We began to change our schedule from having week-long revivals to having all day Sunday. Sunday morning, Sunday night, sometimes three or four services on a Sunday, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and some conferences will go from a Thursday night through a Sunday night. God began to t tell us in that little hall there to do lens of the camera, and now we have had as many in one meeting. Now, Charlie can verify this because we see the pictures. This is not guesswork, and they count them, 72,000 people in one meeting in which I was preaching from a screen live in front of 72,000 people. They spent a month knocking on doors, getting those 72,000 people in a foreign country. And I preached on a screen and had 32,000 people say for the first time. After, isn't, that to, isn't that wonderful? To God be the glory for... So God has honored the lens of the camera. And this year, we actually have reached more. We are now on in Russia. We are now have a YouTube channel being translated into Russian. We have a uh, web page translated into Russian, the Ukraine. Uh, we are on television in the Pacific Rim. Uh, th th what I'm trying to say is this year, which is 2023, the Ministry of Voice of Evangelism has reached more souls, more people, one more people than any time that I can recall in 47 years of full-time ministry. And let's, can we give God praise for that? To Him alone, to God alone is the glory. Now, this is leading me to take you somewhere. This is the reason I'm sharing this with you. I would have been content, and I'm going to use the word content, being able to go to... Pam and I went to Hawaii for two and a half weeks. We preached in great churches there. Uh, we uh, were happy to be able to go. We've gone to Alaska several times, to Saldanta, Alaska, to Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, preached at some great churches with Sherry. She's probably watching. Maybe Pastor Daniel is watching. We love doing this. And I could say to you that I could have been very content and have been very content just saying, let's go to places that are moving in God. Let's go to places that want to hear the word of the Lord. And that's what we have done for the past couple years. I did. I saw something a couple weeks ago that I really did not think I would see again in my lifetime. It came out of the blue. It was totally unexpected. It was not pre-planned. I received a call from my dear friend, Pastor Jensen Franklin to conclude a Sunday night service. He had one Sunday night was Jimmy Evans, or one Sunday. One Sunday was John Hagee. Uh, I'm not sure who was the third one. You remember who the, there were four of us. I can't remember the third person. And he said to me, I want you to conclude our Signs of the Time service. We've only have it on Sunday night. And I actually was supposed to be there Sunday morning, but my wife had booked an Alabama football game. And <laughs> You don't go against Pam when she has an Alabama football game. She goes to one or two a year, and that's our family. That's our date time, and I was happy to do that. We show up at Gainesville on a Sunday night, and they don't normally have a Sunday night service. And when I pulled in, I said, is this, are these, is this the revival people? I mean, are these the people coming to church? They said, yeah, we have four parking lots, and they're all packed out way before church. When I came in, they hold about 3,000 people. Every seat was taken in the building. And then there were 400 people in the lobby trying to get in. And actually, they put seats in the lobby. They told me at one time there were 500 kids under five years of age or two years of age in the nursery. That wasn't counting the kids. Wow. The, the power of God broke out totally unexpected. And Jensen said, well... Let's go Monday and Tuesday because they don't have a Wednesday service. They have a youth service on Wednesday. Well, on Monday and Tuesday, I thought, well, you know, people just don't go to church on Monday and Tuesday. 3,000 showed up with 400 in the overflow. Tuesday night, 3,000 showed up with 600 in the overflow. He said, well, maybe we better take it to Wednesday night. Wednesday night, they started getting to church two hours wrapped around the building. It, it reminded me of what you talked about at Brownsville. And, if, and, and people start coming early. And then we went through Friday. And then Sunday night, I saw something I didn't think I'd ever see in my lifetime. 
I really didn't. I've seen great revivals. I can tell you we've seen, we've seen revivals where it's standing room only. It's packed out. The, the town's excited. But I never saw a town get into anything like this in my life. The entire town was talking. That night, as we pulled up to church, they not only used three parking lots, they had used the business parking lot, and they were shuttling people in, and they turned away hundreds of people who couldn't get in the parking lot of the building. 5,200 people showed up on a Sunday night at a church that normally doesn't have a Sunday night service. There was 1,000 people in the overflow. The amazing thing was not the crowds. It, I mean, it was... And we continued on through the next Friday, but it was the altar services. I would do the same thing every night. I'd say, if you're a backslider, if you're a sinner and you need to repent, I'm going to count to three, get to the altar. And there were times that five to 800 people ran to the altar. There was not a night, I want you to hear me, in 12 nights that I could step off the platform because the, the aisles and the front was filled with people. An entire football team showed up. Sounded like a Nick Walker meeting. The cheerleaders were getting saved. The kids were getting filled with the Holy Ghost by the hundreds. And I just watched, and I said, can this really be happening in America today? Can it really? Can, can we talk about it? And Pastor and I kind of came to an agreement because people said, why didn't you carry it on? Well, first of all, he has four campuses, and you've got Thanksgiving dinners, you've got uh, Bible study, you've got discipleship classes, you've got uh, a big Christmas cantata, and you just, it's very, you have to look, look, when you have real revival, your, your schedule changes completely. It throws everything off. And we were getting to the point where people were starting to fly in, and we agreed, and I talked to him, and we talked together, we wanted it to be a regional meeting affecting Atlanta and Gainesville and not have 2,000 people flying in that were standing outside and his people not get to come. Right. Now, we don't know what we're going to do. We've, even, we've talked about different things. And he says, you know, I'm open to what God, we may crank it up again. I don't know what we're going to do. And it may be, that may be just a season that we saw that and, and it built the church and just did so many wonderful things and people getting baptized, testimonies are incredible. But... My point is, and this is really interesting, I never expected it. I didn't think I'd ever see it again. And you know what? I could be happy doing what I'm doing. I still like traveling. Pam still likes traveling. Pam likes to leave Cleveland because the food's different in different places. That's what she told me one day. I hope she doesn't get me when I get home for saying that. <laughs> Oh my, are you still here saving me? Because I haven't got to where I'm going yet. And I'm going to say this carefully and vaguely. God did something for me. And I preached a message called Wounded, How to Restore Your Wounded Soul. And in that message, I told a story that most people had never heard. I remember the month, I remember the day when I was at home. And I got a phone call from five preachers. It was a conference call. They were all on the line. Marcus Lamb, Rich Wilkerson, Ted Shuttlesworth, Who's the pa he pastors in Miami? He's, his dad was uh, Melody Lane in California. Rich Wilkerson and my friend Jensen Franklin. And I told them I was tired, I was burnt out with ministry, and I was about to just call it quits. I said, I've given my life to preach to people and watched them stab me in the back and cut me down like a dog and even lie on me when they didn't have to tell the lie. And I'm done. And every one of those men prayed and gave me a word. And I just hid it in my heart. I didn't get up and tell people, but I hid it in my heart. And I looked at Jensen on a Wednesday night 
in front of 4,000 people and 80,000 people on the internet and said, you, my friend, saved my life because I was done with it all. I had burnt myself to a crisp. You all don't even know how burnt out I was. You, you just heard stories and things probably. You have no idea. Jensen said to me on a Friday night, he said, do you understand what God did for you? <laughs> I said, well, I never thought I'd see it. He said, no. Do you know how many preachers are calling me saying that meeting was for Perry Stone? Because so many people said bad things about him that God said, I'm going to avenge him of his adversary. And I'm going to, and I'm, I'm it, listen, it's not about me. I want you to understand what I'm saying and how I'm saying this. That God did something that people had to say, oh my goodness, did you hear about this? Oh my goodness, did you hear about that? Did you hear what God is doing? And it's real interesting that the theme of the whole revival every night was not prophecy. And this is the point I'm going to make if you didn't get to watch it. It was about restoration. The whole, the whole revival. It was repentance and restoration. And what I have gone through has made me very sensitive to people's problems. And when I hear people talk about they're depressed. I've been there. When I heard people talk about I want to quit, I've been there. When people talk about they're so tired they can't even get up, I have been there a lot. And God has taken <laughs> what Pam's favorite verse seems to be is Genesis 50. God has taken what the enemy meant for evil and turned it for his good. That's the bottom line to everything. Now, I'm going to break this down to Cleveland, Tennessee. Okay. There are three things that the Lord showed me in the Gainesville outpouring. Number one, certain areas are ripe for revival while other areas are not. Bonke said, Reinhard Bonke said, not all God's harvest fields are ripe at the same time. How does a Brownsville break out, but nothing else in Florida breaks out around it? How does a Gainesville break out when you don't hear of anything else happening in the Atlanta area, the Georgia area? Because the ripeness of the people's heart to receive the now word of God. Hunger versus appetite. Some people say, I'm so hungry for God. No, you're not. You have an appetite for God. If you're hungry, you're going to pray, you're going to seek, you're going to get up in the morning, you're going to walk the outside and ask God for a move of his spirit that it's, you're going to die if you don't get it. Come on, somebody, hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Jensen had a group of people that prayed for years for there to be a breakthrough in the area. Years. We have prayed here on Thursday nights, starting at the prayer barn, then the small room, back at the barn, now at Omega Center, I'm sorry, at ISO, 12 years. I want to say to you that the scripture says, those who sow in tears will reap in joy, and that weeping might endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning, and I'm going to publicly stand as the Holy Ghost is running up and down the avenues of my soul and tell you there is no way that this group of 300, 400, 500 people can pray every Thursday night for 12 years without sooner or later God suddenly showing up in his temple and breaking loose a move. Oh, I felt that in my spirit. It's impossible for God to ignore what's happening in the spirit with prayer. And this is where I want to challenge this congregation on a Tuesday night. You know, we're unique. We're very unique. Someone said, where did you get the idea of having a service on a Tuesday night? Well, because everybody's got church on Sunday and Wednesday. So Tuesday was the best day. But Joyce Meyer 
when she was starting her teaching ministry, started at Rick Shelton's church in St. Louis, a church I preached in many times when Rick was the pastor. And Rick said she started on a Tuesday a Bible study at 10 in the morning. It may have been 10 or 12, somewhere around there. And she had 50 ladies show up. And then next thing, she's got 100 ladies showing up. And then she's got 1,000 ladies. Joyce Meyer, this is before Joyce was ever on television. Nobody knew who Joyce was. I mean, she used to have her Bible study in hot pants smoking cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> Until they finally told her she needed to change the, her outfit and quit smoking. You've probably heard her talk about that. She started having more people on Tuesday than the church had on Sunday. It was a big church. And she started selling more tapes than the pastor. I said, did that upset you? He said, no, because I knew the hand of God was on her. I said, Lord, just keep bringing them. He said, the more you bring here, the more people going to join my church. Come on, keep bringing them. I'm, I'm happy. But she started on a Tuesday. And I told Mark Casto when he was here, I said, we're going to have a Tuesday service. He said, that's an odd time to have service. I said, if it'll work for Joyce, it'll work for us. Come on now. <laughs> and honestly, it has. I do realize, though, what a challenge. Dr. Cutshaw and I have talked about this. We're not a full-service church. We're not a Sunday church. We don't have any plans to ever do that, the Lord willing. But I want to tell you it's different because most people work eight hours a day on Tuesday. Most people want to get their kids in bed early on Tuesday. So to have three to 400 people every week showing up to a service on a Tuesday night is somewhat of a miraculous situation, but it demonstrates to me somebody is hungry to fellowship with God and with the people of God on a Tuesday night. Now, here's what I want to tell this congregation. And Braden, where are you at? Where, let me tell you, you've bumped up. I'll say it to you publicly. You used to get up there and sing, and it was good, but you're bumping up now because you're starting to move in the Holy Ghost. And I know you can tell it. We've not even talked about this, but I, could, I walked in tonight. I said, whoa, now the, oil, the oil's getting all over the boy. You can tell it. <laughs> now, he's, I call him a boy because he starts singing for me when he was eight years old, okay? So I've known him a long time. But sometimes as you're worshiping, I can sense it and feel it, but the crowd, and I know you know this. We've never discussed this. They, you sometimes act, feel like they're disconnected. It's like, okay, where are you all at? Let me tell you the key of Jensen Franklin's church. He's not just a great preacher. He's one of the greatest preachers. My wife would, would, listens to him every time she gets an opportunity to, all right? Does that make you jealous? No, because I'm still her favorite preacher, okay? So no, it doesn't make me jealous. I'm happy because I love to hear the man preach. But when they worship, I'm going to tell you what I saw for 12 nights, Sunday morning early. Everybody in the building is standing and everybody's worshiping. There's nobody doing this. There's nobody doing that. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. And that's where you're falling short. That's where this group of people is falling short. You're letting them bless you with music, but you're not entering in with worship. Now listen to me because I'm about to lay, lay something on you. We, you'll never have the type of revival that carries the presence till everybody in the house becomes a worshiper. Now, I'm telling you, the Lord told me to tell you this. So from this moment on, on Tuesday nights, when this group worships, I want to hear, as one of your leaders, everybody in this house singing the song. And you, you listen to me. If you'll do this cor corporate anointing, you will find the greatest shifting in the atmosphere of this place that you've ever seen. And you're going to start seeing the power of God manifest greater before the preaching ever takes place. I saw it with my eyes and I said, that's the, we, look, we got the preaching. We got the people. We've got the volunteers. Come on, talk to me, somebody. We got the facility for goodness sakes. The offerings are, are, are doing well. We got everything here, and we lack. Just like, just like the Lord said to a church, you're doing everything right, but one thing thou lackest. And the only thing I see that we've got to polish and we've got to sharpen is our corporate worship when the worship's taking place. Can I plant that seed in your spirit tonight? 
Because when revival comes, when revival comes to the level it can, you have to have worship bringing a whole multitude of people. Can I tell you why? Because as visitors come in, they shift the atmosphere of your building. Now, I'm talking about revival, not Tuesday night. When you have revival and you get 50 to 100 to 300 visitors that have come in and they're from a nominal church, they're not from a Pentecostal church, they can shift it. I saw it in my meetings and I think, what happened tonight? Well, the visitors were not necessarily into that. They wanted to hear the preaching or they wanted to see what was going on. They were curious. But that's why you have to be strong in the level of worshiping God so that the atmosphere is set so that when God begins to bring people here, they don't affect you, you affect them. <laughs> Your worship rubs off on them, all right? That's one of the things the Lord wanted me to share with you about... about We've, been, we've done everything right. I really do. We, we, we're, we're hungry. There's a lot of you hungry. You show up to prayer on, on, on uh, Thursday night. We have been praying for 12 years. We've been sowing in tears. We've created an atmosphere that's going to get deeper and better. But I want to concentrate on something about Cleveland, Tennessee as a town. Are you all ready to go there with me? This was a message for the house. I almost thought about not putting this on the Internet, just preaching to the house. But uh, uh, then uh, the people on the Internet lose the victory. You understand what I'm saying? So, uh, so just know that I'm not planning on cutting the... They beg me on Facebook, don't cut the service off, don't cut the service off. So we're not planning on doing that. Most of you know that there's a church here called Faith Memorial that um, a... The, is he here? Is Brother Cranfield here, here tonight? Sometimes he's here on Tuesday. I don't know. He's not here tonight. But the pastor happens to be a young man who attended the extreme when Mark Casto and I were working together. He was one of the young men. Most of you don't know that unless you attend the, uh, the church there. And it was in that building on the Old Faith Memorial, the brick church, that a man of God that was very well known for miracles and healings, you know, the internet criticizes him. I'm so sick of that. There are going to be a lot of people in hell because they ran their mouth. I had to say that. I'm sorry. In 1959, in the month of June, and that happens to be the same month and the same year when I was born in West Virginia, this man said that an angel of God came to him. He told Pastor Littlefield this and said that, Cleveland, Tennessee would be a hub, and I believe that was the word he may have used, for the end-time revival before the Lord would return in the rapture. Now, I want to talk to you about Cleveland, Tennessee. Cleveland, Tennessee is a really good town to live in, and I'm not just saying that. We have our crime. We have our elements. We have some unfriendly people. Uh, but... As far as a town compared to other towns and cities, it is a good town to live in. The second thing about Cleveland is that we have about, and I've been told this, I went to the internet and I could count 300, but the, the, the word is that with small churches and church that meet, use other buildings, there's over 350 in Bradley County churches, which is one of the most church counties in the entire United States. And I've said to myself, Lord, I know that you gave a man in 1959 a word about this city would be a hub for revival prior to the rapture. And I heard it for years when I moved here. I didn't move here because of that, but I heard it when I moved here. You got Judy Jacobs. You have our ministry. You have the Bible college. You have the school of theology. You have the, the great churches, the great Baptist church over here, by the way. And I said to the Lord, how, <laughs> Lord, let this not be unbelief. How do you send a revival to a town that has 380 active churches all doing their own thing? You can't get three youth groups in this town to work together because every church has their own youth group doing their own thing. And if you try to unite them, which we have, and we do at Warrior Fest sometimes, they are afraid that somebody's going to meet somebody and they're going to lose their young people, so they just as soon stay in their church. 
God told me four things about Cleveland. He said, the problem with Cleveland, Tennessee is they are content and have need of nothing. I heard someone say this in the spirit. We don't need a revival when we have good services. And the Lord told me, he said, when I look at Cleveland, I see people saying, we have a great church with great music. We don't need some long revival here. The churches are content and have need of money. They have no need of money. They can pay their bills. They have no need of facilities. Well, Rhonda does. <laughs> but I'm talking about in general. They have their facilities. A lot of the facilities are paid for. So I want to keep that in mind. This is not a criticism. This is an observation about revival. The second thing he told me about, <coughs> give me some water, Nick, if you would, or uh, somebody un undo this one, is if you're in the military, I had a former worker say this one time. I thought it was good. I hope I can remember how they said it. In the military, the reason the military is so powerful is men fight together, but in the body of Christ, we fight each other. And it creates a spirit of competition where each person stays in their own sheep pen and only attends their own conferences. And I'm going to tell you something I've noticed here, and I don't mind this. Thousands of people come to these conferences, and I do not mind, and I do understand a lot of them are coming out of town. But do you realize that when we have the greatest speakers in the world in this building, we can't get townspeople to show up? And I'm going to tell you what a pastor told me. Perry, they're afraid of you and Brian, and they're afraid that you'll start a church one day and pull their members out. So they do not support your meetings. That's what a pastor told me. I said, well, we're just here doing the work of God on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Wow. So everybody stays with their group. Because they're competing with the others. Then the Lord said this. Most Sundays in Cleveland, the churches are praying for their own needs and not praying for lost souls and backsliders. Number four, the churches in Cleveland, Tennessee, by and large, have no spiritual hunger pains because they can snack when they want. Explain that one. Medical doctor, Dr. Jeremy Lewis said there's a difference between appetite and hunger. He said when you have appetite, you can get crackers and be satisfied. You can eat an apple and be satisfied. Two scoops of peanut butter in a spoon will satisfy you. But he said when you're hungry, you want to sit down to a three-part meal, a steak, come on, mashed potatoes. When you're hungry, you want to eat more than crackers. He spoke to him and he said they can have a snack when they want. I'm talking about Cleveland. Again, listen to me. This is not an assault of criticism. This is why we're not having the revival that has been prophesied since 1959. Here are your four reasons why it hasn't happened. Now this is, I'm almost done. And the other day I was thinking about the word that the man gave. And how he said it, he said it would be a hub. <clears throat> he talked about Faith Memorial up on that hill and how God would bless it. And he has blessed it. Brother Littlefield fed the city. He was the pastor of Cleveland. Am I telling the truth? And, and even Hank had, how long was his revival? Hank had a nine-week revival at Faith Memorial. See, some of you weren't around then. I, was, I preached over there then at Faith Memorial. So see, we've seen that. I'm going to say this because I thought it was special, but Brother Cran Cranfield called me. He said, we're going to remodel the church. How would you like the pulpit where the prophecy came on over? And I have it right now, and we're getting ready to put it right back here as a reminder to God. We are ready to fulfill the time, the time that you want. Listen to me because Gainesville taught me something. And this is going to be different. As I begin to think about that word, what does it mean to be a hub for a revival that leads to the great coming of the Lord? We think of a building 
with protracted meetings with large crowds that line around the building. That's the traditional idea of revival. However, I saw something I have never seen in my life at Gainesville. The online audience was having bigger results than in the building. People were being knocked out by the Spirit in their beach houses getting the Holy Ghost that had never been baptized in the Holy Ghost. We got emails. They got emails. We got so many emails. There were 40,000 to 60,000 people online. And there were places with 25 people in Kentucky, 300 people in South Carolina, churches that were online. And we estimate the audience was 300,000 people watching. And as the altar call would be given, they sent me a picture of a girl that must have been eight years old and she's watching me preach and then her mother snaps this picture where she's on her face before God weeping, a eight-year-old girl. When Warrior Fest was canceled because of COVID, Mandy's the one that gave me these statistics a while back, Mandy who works here. We could not put but uh, 10 people on the platform during the second Warrior Fest. If you'll remember, we had a team called... Uh, Thank you. I want to go chosen there. That's different. Remnant, and uh, they were here. And then, Braden, were you here during COVID? We had a band. We had nobody here. Eddie James was up singing. There's nobody here. But guess how many people? Now, Mandy told me this. I said, are you sure of the number? She said, absolutely. Guess how many people are watching it live online? 100,000. And we only get 4,000 people in the building. So we had, somebody give me math on that. If you get 4,000 in the building, you got over 100,000. What, what, watch them. What percentage is that? You think so? Is that right? Huh? I'm not going to ask y'all no math questions from here on out because you, you're, you're as bad at it as I am. I can't figure out math. I never, how much? It would be four. No, more than that. Anyway, let's just get off of that. I shouldn't even have brought that up. That's got me distracted. Now I have to figure that out again. But we have, we have, we have, you know, 4,000 watching because we never put it online. And yet in that 100,000, if you'll remember, I had them scroll, a scroll here. I just got the Holy Ghost in the UK. My daughter just got out of a wheelchair. It was coming up on the screen. Does anybody remember it coming up on? I'm thinking, oh my Lord, what is going on here? Yeah. Okay. Stay with me. Lens of the camera a few months ago, 71,000 people there, 35,000 or 32,000, I think it was saved. So here's what I want to tell you. Could it be, could it be that this meeting is not so much everybody coming here, but us taking it to the world from here? It hit me, Rhonda. It really hit me. Because we could do an online revival anytime. And if you want to come, you come. And if you want to stay home, you stay home. Because I saw hundreds saved and filled with the Holy Ghost that I never met through a camera in Gainesville, Georgia. Thousands of people. And I said, oh, my Lord, the power of God doesn't just work in a building. It works by sending the word. So here's what I want you to open your spirit up to. And, and I didn't even run this by Dr. Cutshaw, and I know he's watching, and I know he'll comment on this. But, it, but no, in a positive way, because him and I are in agreement. We've never, we, do you realize we've never been in disagreement one time, Dr. Cutshaw and I? Never. We've been in agreement ever since we've known each other. We've never had a disagreement. Boy, what a, what a friend to have that never disagrees with you. Is it possible, and I'm going to conclude with this thought. <laughs> no sounds, please. No sounds. Is it possible that, yes, God can do it, but could it begin in a social media format that goes to the world where this is the hub? Wait a minute. We have a computer system, a hub for voice of evangelism 
in a facility underground here that is a hub, but everything in that hub goes to the world. Hub, here's the hub, here's the headquarters, but we take it through every form of media and we just run it and we just preach it and then those who come wants to come. And I'm going to tell you what would happen. Once the power of God starts healing and delivering people, they will come. But, but never expect, and maybe my expectations are too low for other churches. Never expect other churches to show up in this building and join us with anything. It hasn't happened in 46 years. It will never happen. Don't limit God. No, no, no. I know what I'm telling you by what the Spirit told me. Too content, too much competition, but that's not what's important. You don't have to have a whole bunch of Christians having a Christianese camp meeting and coming together and having a Christianese revival. I want souls saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, people healed, people delivered from oppression, and most of them are not in a church. They're out there. So I've I want to challenge you tonight to expand your thinking and not limit it to when will the meeting break out here? Because God may have a plan that we don't even know about. And if he does it the way he wants to do it, it will be a glorious time. But you have got to be ready for it. And you got, you'll have to change schedules when it comes. You'll get a little tired. You'll have to get your B vitamin, your energy drink. Lord forbid they were trying to get me to quit drinking those. But you'll have to change some things. But you will be a part. I still believe what I'm saying. However God's going to do this, we're going to be a part of something. Because God's word does not change with circumstances. I preach this to you. It can be delayed, but it's never going to be denied. Stand up on your feet and give God praise. Lift your hands all over this place. Thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of God that is in here. This, let's, let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of God that is in this place. Thank you for the word that you've given me, God. I don't say anything negative about this town nor the churches because there are great churches and great ministers here, but I say this in the level of the revival that we don't have to have 25 churches coming together to do what you want to do. We don't have to have but a group of people that are hungry for what you want to do, Father. So in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to touch every person to expand our thinking, to expand our mind beyond what we thought we this was about to what it's supposed to look like and expand it in Jesus' name to a move of the Spirit. Praise God. Praise your name. Somebody get the, the, the team of kids back up on the platform. Ask Katie. Uh, ask Katie to just do this as fast as they can. Thank you, Lord. But all the kids that are part of the... Um, Awaken, come back on the platform. And Do Jonathan, get ready. I want them to do something. Praise God. Before you leave, how many are saved? Raise your hand. Are you, are you born again? Are you love, do you love the Lord? Would you lay your hand on somebody while I start praying? Father, as we lay hands on each other in Jesus' name, I come to you and I ask you to bring healing. I'm asking you to bring deliverance. I'm asking you to bring family salvation. I'm coming into agreement with him, Heavenly Father, that the power of sickness and the power of death will be brought broken in the life of their family. Oh, I come to you, Father, and ask you, we don't know what a revival, we know what it looks like, we know traditionally what happens, but I'm praying, Father, that you will do something that's beyond and exceeding abundantly above all, that we could even ask or think according to the power that works in us. And I'm asking you, God, to release men and women and to break the yoke and break the bondage and to break the powers of the enemy that have tried to tie people up and tie them down and hinder them and depress them, God, and bring them down. Father, in Jesus' name, in your time, oh, God, in your time, in your due season, I'm asking you, Father, to move. I'm asking you to touch. I'm asking you to do, bring that, bring the reviving, bring the reviving. God, I pray that even in this town, when it happens, that it will break out in churches, that it will break out in individual places, that it will break out, God. Take away the contentment that 
that we've had. Oh, come on, saints of God, agree with me. Take away the contentment that they've had, the just being satisfied with the basics, God. We don't want to be satisfied in any more in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to have that move in your time. Put your hand up and shout this with me. In due time, in due season, the Lord will perform what he has said for his glory in the name of Jesus. Everybody put your hands together, open up your mouth and praise God for one minute. Come on, for one minute.